So according to the IDSA, which is the Infectious Disease Society Association, the vast majority of Lyme meets the CDC surveillance criteria. You get an erythema migrans rash, which is, you know, the bullseye rash. Some of you may get Bell's palsy. Some of you get heart block, meningitis or arthritis. The lab testing is ELISA. It's a screening test. You do that first until you get a Western blot. 10 to 20 days of typically a single antibiotic is effective. Chronic Lyme disease does not exist. And treatment for chronic Lyme disease is not effective, and there is no evidence for persistent infection. This is according to the IDSA. And this is reportedly based on evidence-based medicine. The goal of evidence-based medicine is to integrate the best research evidence with clinical expertise and patient values. The IDSA guidelines based on evidence-based medicine should go with number one as being the reason for its guidelines. Randomized controlled trials that show effective improvement. Sometimes you can go with level two evidence. Well-designed clinical trials, they're not randomized, but you have some dramatic results from uncontrolled trials. The third level of evidence is the least effective because it's really just based on opinions from expert testimony either from descriptive studies or they actually just meet in expert committees. Kahn and Lee did analysis of the IDSA recommendations. It was published in the Clinic of Infectious Diseases and the Archives of Internal Medicine. Both are peer review journals. And essentially, when it was looked at, only 14% of them had level one evidence. More than 55% of them had level three evidence. Level three meaning they just had expert testimony. The Institute of Medicine criticized the IDSA guidelines, stating that the variable quality of the individual scientific studies was too, the quality wasn't there the limitations in its systemic reviews. There weren't clear transparencies of how the studies were done. There was a failure to convene multi-stakeholders. If you're going to have an expert opinion, then one should include Lyme physicians that treat chronic Lyme. You should also probably include some patients. None of that was on the expert testimony. There was non-reconciliation of conflicting guidelines. And there was no management of conflicts of interest. Some of these expert testimonies had um, some of their funding from sources that would suggest that they would be biased against treatment and an overall failure to use rigorous methodologies in coming up with the IDSA recommendations. So more than half of the current recommendations of the IDSA are based on only level three evidence only. The conclusion from this study was that until more data from well-designed controlled clinical trials becomes available, physicians should remain cautious when using current guidelines as the sole source of guiding patient care decisions. Hence, we come back to 85% of the diagnosis is by history and is it by your story. Is what happened? When did it happen? How are you feeling? How did you feel before this happened? What are you feeling now? ILADS 
17 authors, 800 references, exposure of Lyme disease, what's the incidence, the prevalence, what's the evidence of persistent infection, what's the mechanisms of persistent infections, what are the clinical presentations, what are diagnostic evaluations that can be done. What are the lab findings? What are treatment options? What are special groups that we can have involved in getting to that point of treatment? Special groups meaning people like you, people that are scientists, that research how the bug works, and then clinicians. The ILADS criteria meets all these guidelines. There is no variability in the quality. They don't limit systemic reviews. There is transparency. There's no, they really look at not having conflicting interests. And they use rigorous methodologies to come to their conclusions. So what's the biology of this little bugger? Because it's, uh, it's pretty smart. So the organism itself secretes glycoproteins. Glycoproteins are basically sugar put on proteins. Sugar that's put on protein causes pretty severe immune responses. Um, makes antibodies. Sometimes it can make lots of antibodies and overwhelm the system. It also produces lipids and DNA type material which are also immunogenic and toxic in themselves. It's really smart because under certain environments it actually shifts its form, which is like crazy because it like becomes cell wall which that's great, because now let me give it penicillin, amoxicillin, bicillin, ceftriaxin, and it'll work. Because it'll, it actually attacks the cell wall and then it dies because it doesn't have a cell wall. But then guess what? It goes, huh, I'm good. I'm going to shift to the L-shaped form. I don't have a cell wall. That antibiotic doesn't work. And then when it gets really kind of upset about the treatment, it may shift into the cystic form, which then requires another type of antibiotic. The Borrelia also protects itself through these collagen bundles, hiding deep into tissues, making it unavailable for blood testing and cerebral spinal fluid. It produces a biofilm, and some of you have heard of that. If you want to think of biofilm, think about the plaque on your teeth. Kind of tough to brush it off. You need to kind of scrape it. That's pretty similar to what the biofilm is like. It also is slow growing. It is not an actively growing bug. That's actually not good. Because when things grow fast, they're easier to kill. It's also very difficult to grow in culture because if it doesn't grow fast, you got to wait a real long time to get it to grow. So a small number of organisms can secrete huge amounts of these sugar proteins. So here it is. Here's the, the spirochete that you may have seen this is a kind of a blurry picture. This is the L-shaped form. It actually forms L-shaped and circular forms. This is now the non-cell wall form. And this is the uh, cystic form. So common Lyme symptoms. The reason it's such a challenging diagnosis is that, you know, this can feel like a really bad flu. It tends to be slow in onset. You get better, and you get worse. You feel the severe fatigue. 
And roving joint pains, probably one of the most significant in terms of the symptoms. Stiffness or swelling. Hard to think straight. Cognitive problems are impaired. Often sleep is impaired. You may have balance problems. Driving in the car and you feel like the road is shifting. Headaches begin usually in the neck region. Begin up here. You get now all of a sudden you feel like you're old because your joints are cracking. And maybe someone says to you, well, you know, you're getting old. Your joints are painful. Typically the knees and the elbows are the most affected. So the CDC recommendations are screening of sera with Ig class specific ELISA. If that's positive, you go on to a western blot. It's a problem because the western blot is more sensitive than ELISA. In fact, the ELISA is very insensitive. So a great number of patients that if they're only identified through ELISA screening will be missed. And then you'll just be excluded from having Lyme disease. And in fact, not wanting to, but your provider based on that information. And look, the CDC is supposed to be a, a good resource. Based on this CDC recommendation, they'll say, well, I, I'm not going to go any further. Not knowing what the evidence is that makes this effective. So it is our opinion and my opinion that the immunoblot should be the only method used for screening. So again, just I'm trying to hone in on these symptoms here, cognitive problems, neck pain, fatigue. What about co-infections? You know, it used to be that people were told that co-infections are very unlikely. That typically co-infections occur only two to three percent of the time. And again, who knows where those numbers came from because they didn't come from research. They came from just someone saying that's what it is. Because if the research was if the research was looked at, this was back in the 90s, where co-infections for, B for Babesia, for Bartonella, and specifically for Bartonella, were about 66% of the time with Lyme disease. That now Babesia has really taken on a much greater prevalence. Borrelia can do really nasty things to your immune function. It can inhibit your B cell and T cell function, which is specific for your immunological function to try to kill those bad guys. It can decrease your natural killer cells. And Babesia itself worsens these immune functions. It can create endocrine abnormalities, where your blood sugar fluctuates where your thyroid function fluctuates, which you never had before. It causes what's called autonomic dysfunction, where all of a sudden you feel like you're going to pass out because your blood pressure drops. And the neurological dysfunction is severe. 